Hello everyone, my name is Sean Boyle. I'm with Southern Illinois University and this video is going to be about the essential checks that you need to perform when overhauling or working on a JADCO CVT transmission. When these transmissions first started failing and ending up in the shops, parts were difficult to come across. The availability was not there. Since then, that's changed. We've got uh, a company like Sonics, they'll go through and they, they've sourced all the different bearings for these transmissions, which has helped a lot because that was one of the difficult to hard, uh, almost impossible to find parts. They didn't cross-reference. Oh, the, the original ones that came out of the transmission did not cross-reference. So Sonics went through, worked with suppliers, and now they've got a solution to that. They've got bearings. Um, other issues were the steel, seal kits. The seal kit manufacturers, they've come up, they've stepped up, and they've provided seal kits. And there's actually some improvements that they've done. And even things like you can buy new belts now. A lot of people will still reuse a belt if it's not bad, or they'll source a used belt. And that's where some of your parts suppliers come into play. A lot of them are carrying used parts or good quality parts. Uh, they purchase up these cores, disassemble them, and they'll sell pulley sets, belts, uh, valve bodies, that kind of stuff. That allows you different options. If you take this transmission apart and there's a lot of damage, you don't just have to say it's off or not. You, you can actually get some decent used parts and build these things back up. And even the aftermarket, they've stepped up with uh, components to, that will improve upon the original design, so hopefully the failures won't repeat. So let's take a look at some of the must-do things that you have to deal with when you take apart these transmissions. One of the areas that you won't want to skip is the pulley assemblies. You want to take them completely apart, completely disassemble them. You don't want to just inspect them from the outside, and say, yeah, the surface is good, and assume that the whole pulley assembly is good. You definitely want to take these completely apart Sometimes people are hesitant to take these pulleys apart because they don't just come apart easy. You don't just pull a snap ring and it all comes apart. The reason why is because there is a press fit right here on this piston assembly. And so, and then also, like on this pulley assembly at least, we've got a bearing and a gear that also is press fit. So you have to get a puller in there to pull this assembly apart. And this TJ1 right here from PosiLock, it'll do a good job. It grabs onto the sheave. There's a little lip right there that'll grab onto that sheave, and that'll let you pull this pulley assembly apart. And once you have it apart and disassemble it, you'll notice that there on these sheaves, there are these little ball bearing grooves. These ball bearing grooves need to be nice and smooth because that's what allows the pulley half to slide back and forth. Pay close attention to that ball bearing groove right there and make sure there's no uh, burrs or anything like that. Now you're gonna wanna replace these ball bearings. You wouldn't wanna go through and put the, the old ones back in. The ball bearings seem to take a lot of force. They, it's basically the only thing that's preventing the movable half of the pulley from breaking loose and spinning. And that seems to be what happens when these fail. As you can see on this piece here, we had catastrophic damage on that one. And it likely happened because the check balls probably broke and got caught in there and things got jammed. Now with some builders, instead of going back with the ball bearings, with their seal kit that they get, this is from Seal Aftermarket Products, they'll actually put in these rollers in their place. And uh, newer CVT units in like Hondas, for example, they actually use rollers from the factory. So there's really nothing wrong with this. And what happens is this roller Instead of having three ball bearings in there, you have a roller that is the same length as three ball bearings put together. So now, instead of having just a point on each side of a ball bearing, you have the full contact of that roller pin in place. So that is an upgrade. Some techs don't like to put those in. They feel they're too tight to go in there. And if they are too tight, there's nothing wrong with going back with ball bearings. I would just make sure, if I were you, that there are new ball bearings. Now, another thing to look at on these is the pulley surface. Sometimes the pulley will be scuffed. There'll be some radial marking that goes all the way around it. And a lot of times when you look at that, you'll assume that the pulley's bad. You'll think it's, it's been gouged. Sometimes that is actually buildup on the surface. So what a lot of shops will do is they'll chuck this up in a lathe and use sandpaper and work their way up from a coarse grit to a fine grit, maybe end at 320, and you'll actually be able to get that material off. This is because the belt scuffed basically on the surface or 
it trapped contaminants from the torque converter or from a bearing that's failing in between the sheave surface and the belt, and it kind of smeared it on there. Because these surfaces are extremely hard, so there's less likely of a chance that it's gouged the pulley surface and more of a chance that it's actually torn up the belt. And that brings you to the next topic here, is the, are these belts. When you inspect the belt, you're actually looking at this surface right here. You're looking at the sides. If you look from the side, they make like a P shape. They look like individual P's lined up against each other. This thing rotates in the direction of the P's. So the P's, the little heads, if you will, are going in the direction of rotation. And you look at that surface to see if there's been damage to this belt. It should have ridges like the edge of a quarter or a dime. If it's smeared at all, then it's bad. And if you're working on a JF-015, that's the one that has the auxiliary gearbox and actually has a shift in it. On their primary pulley, they have a little piston that's a press fit on this inner surface. Sometimes that gets loose, and this is actually the one that came out of a unit, and it does not fit with the press fit now um, in that center section. Transgo makes a replacement piston for that. And it's something that you're going to want to do on every transmission, every JF-015E. Everyone should get one of those billet pistons that they make. The reason why I don't have one in that box is because it's in a unit, and this is a, the original one that came out of it. That's a good upgrade. Another thing that you're going to want to look out for on the JF-015E, I don't have a pulley assembly here, but where their pulley assembly, the drum that the pistons fit into, it's, it's kind of a press fit up against the pulley itself and the reluctor ring that the speed sensor picks up on is wedged in between the drum and the pulley half. Over time, they might split apart a little bit, and that lets the reluctor ring spin in there, like there's no grab. And then you'll get speed sensor and gear ratio codes, that kind of stuff. So you want to press that back together when you rebuild this, and most techs will either take a TIG welder and they'll tack it, or they'll solder it. They'll heat it up just enough to get a, you know, some solder to melt onto it, and it doesn't take much because it's not, there's no force on it, but when those two pieces, when that drum and that sheave separate a little bit, there's no pinch, there's no grab, and that can spin, and that's going to cause a failure in the transmission, set codes, put you in fail-safe, all because of that. Another common failure with these transmissions that definitely needs to be addressed is their oil pump. They've got a dual inlet um, and outlet pump, so it's actually a really efficient pump. This thing is really generates over 800 PSI, so it's a very important part to this transmission to make it live. The reason why it generates more than 800 PSI is because that's how much force we need to squeeze these pulleys onto that belt so they don't slip. Very important that this pump works the way it's supposed to. So when you take this assembly apart, a few things that you might notice. One is there's a little dimple right there on this outer slide assembly. And you'll see dimples on the underside of the rotor, and they go opposite. Do that just to confuse you, I'm sure. So the area that fails most in this oil pump is the flow control valve. This is the original flow control valve right here. This is an OE flow control valve. It's brand new. This thing doesn't have any miles on it. It's in great condition. And the flow control valve, it goes into this bore right here. So line pressure gets exposed into this area right here when this pump is operating. And it finds its way into the transmission through this hole, comes out, that's actually where it gets pumped into the transmission. And it samples that pressure right there. The flow control valve samples that pressure, it ends up coming through that little passageway right there and gets on the spring side of this valve. So it's on the spring side of this valve. Well, as pressure builds up, it also gets into this little passage down there, and that works on the other side of the valve. Let me pull the valve back out. It works on this side of the valve. When it moves this valve over far enough, it takes the line pressure that's built by this pump and dumps it back into the inlet. That basically ultimately regulates this pump output. If this moves over far enough to let line pressure back into the inlet, this isn't going to be able to build any more pressure. Matter of fact, it doesn't take much to move this valve over. It only takes about 30 psi of difference of pressure from one side to the other 
to make this valve move over far enough to release the pressure to the pump's intake. So this is a very important valve, and this is one of the areas that fail most frequently in these transmissions. And you can see the scuffing that's occurred. So these are the flow control valves that are used, and you can see a lot of scuffing that's occurred on these valves. Those lines that are going across there where debris got in there, that will hang the valve up and make it stick. And if it sticks in a spot with low output, obviously this transmission is not going to build the pressure that it needs, and you're not going to get the gear ratios that you need. You're going to set pressure sensor codes, possibly, and uh, that's those are big failures. So how does the aftermarket deal with that? So this is a drop-in flow control valve from Transgo, and what they do is they completely put their own little sleeve, their own little spring, and their own little piston in there. So it pushes in, and actually it does push in with a little bit of force when you push that in. So the, the function, the passages and all that stuff still are the same, but they just re-engineered their own valve made out of steel with their own little spring. So this is a drop-in replacement, no machining. If you ordered this, you take your damaged one out, you put this one in, and you've applied the fix. So this right here is a Sonics replacement valve. It is not a drop-in valve. They do make a drop-in valve. This valve right here, though, you actually have to use a reamer. You'll mount this to the fixture, to the uh, Sonax's reaming fixture, and you'll go ahead and run a pilot in there, and then you'll run your reamer through there, and this opens that bore up about 25 thousandths of an inch. So if there's a lot of damage in there, you can ream it, and now you got a nice smooth surface for your new replacement valve. They do make a drop-in valve, but if you've got a bore that's really damaged, you might need to go through and use a reamer like this. Open it up, and then you can use, you can salvage a pump and end up using their oversized flow control valve. So either way, if you are overhauling one of these transmissions, you definitely want to address the flow control valve either with a drop-in valve from like Transgo or Sonics or through reaming it and replacing it with a oversized valve. Now a lot of technicians replace the valve body um, when they overhaul these transmissions because they find them finicky. Especially on the JF015E, the price for the valve body is not very high, at least as of now. Uh, what you'd want to do is look up technical service bulletins because a lot of times they'll put a valve body part number in a technical service bulletin, and then when you search that number, or you go, take that number to Nissan, it's, it's an inexpensive valve body. It might be less than $200, complete with the solenoids. Now that might not be the case for all of them, but it's definitely worth checking out. The other thing to take into consideration, if your transmission came with this ROM right there, you're going to want to consider keeping this with the vehicle, even if you replace the transmission or the valve body. And the reason why is because this is matched to the valve body, but it's also matched to the TCM. The TCM is going to look for this. And if you put an a, exchange this valve body for a different one, it's going to expect to be programmed, and it's also going to expect to see uh, a certain VIN. And if it doesn't see that, it's likely going to set a code. So what a lot of techs do is they keep the harness and the ROM with the original vehicle with whatever they're replacing, even if it's a new transmission. Otherwise, you're going to need to reprogram the unit. And to do that, you're going to need the Nissan Consult 3 Plus. And some techs have had luck getting a short-term subscription, like a three-day subscription, installing the software and doing the update. Some techs just deliver the vehicle to the dealer and have them do it and uh, just basically cha uh, be charged the dealer rate. So hopefully this little summary of all the different things that you can do to make a CVT live will help. If you're taking this apart, this transmission apart, realize that there are aftermarket upgrades, realize that there are parts available, and realize that some of these fixes right here will make the transmission live. Thank you.